like I said, um, it was a little, like I say in Rocky is, um, I work as a, when I'm not here or in the church I go to is Lakewood Baptist Church. And even when I was here at Calvary, I always worked with the youth group. And so talking to youth this big, no problem. Go talk to kids, uh, kids 50 to 100, no problem. Whatever reason, when y'all get over 21, that just makes me go, what in the world am I doing? Why am I, am I, am I, am I, I feel like a new rookie trying to figure out my first fire and trying to figure out what clothes do I wear, what do I need to look like. Um, I don't know why that is, except the fact that God, God does something with me at 50 years old. I'm almost 50 years old that I still love working with youth and I still love working with kids. Um, one of the most exciting things that I enjoy doing, and I think most firefighters will say this, is working with classrooms, working with kids, because we touch them so early and we can see them so early that we can actually make a difference, even from the way that they, um, how they understand fire safety to just being a good character um, and how we impact them in that area. How do we, I mean, several of you, the ones who've ever been in the schools, for that one moment that we walk into a school and we see their uniform, they see the badge, for that one moment, they want to be you. You're more important to them than any basketball player, any football player, because they want to be you at that moment. Because they know what you do is important in life. You make a difference. And they want to be able to do that. So let me introduce myself. I am Captain Summers with the Rocky Fire Department. I've been there right at 18 years. Um, I do have my wife, Christine, is here with me, and my son, Noah Summers. Uh, we did attend Calvary Church um, when we first moved to Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, I'm currently at Lakewood Baptist Church right now. And, uh, and when Brent called me, I was like, yeah, this is great. And I talked to my wife. I said, you know, because I'm smart. I'm pretty smart. <laughs> when you end up, go talk to your wife and she'll set you straight. And she said, you know, the biggest thing right now is what you need to do. And I said, you need to pray about it. But she told me, she goes, why don't you just give the gospel away? You know how to give it through what? Because they all know. I said, they're all veterans of something. They're veterans of military. They're veterans of police department. They're veterans of EMT or something. They know what you are. They know what you feel like right now. And they know the, um, cause I'll be honest with you, if you talk to any firefighter, you put me on a fire ground and a burning fire and it can be as hot as I'll get out. I have no nerves because I know that's what I was paid to do and that's what I know I'm trained to do, you know? But I'm not trained to really do this. And I was like, man, I'm nervous. That's how, how, how do I overcome that? So when I say that, it's like, it brings me to this point right here, and this is really what I want to try to get to today. Is I want to talk about something I've thought about is le legacy through identity. A legacy through identity is like, how do you see as you identify me? When you first walked in, you saw the uniform, you see, okay, I'm dressed in my class A, but you see a firefighter, and that's what you identify with. The first thing the kids told me is, thank you for your service. I'm so proud that you teach them that. From military, police, the fire, they love to hear. But the thing about it is, what do you see? How do you identify? I told you I was married. So the first thing you think, okay, he's a husband. I got a son. You say he's a father, too. But here's the thing about it. As how, when we get done tonight, how will you identify me? Will you still see me as a firefighter? Or do you see me as I need to see me as a man of God? That's where, if I've done my job when I get thrown tonight, is that you can see past the fact I'm a fireman, a fire, a husband, and a father, that I'm a man of God. Or trying. And a lot of times I get choked up by that because I try to realize I'm a broken man of God. That I'm broken and I'm having to be repaired daily. I have to be restored daily. I have to go to my prayer time daily to get to the point of being the man that I need to be for my family. And if I'm a man for my family, then I can be a man in the community for you guys. 
And that's where I want to be when I get that. And so part of it's talking about is the legacy. Is I'm fortunate. A lot of people are not as fortunate as me. My legacy started way before me. My grandparents were Christians. And the thing I love to talk about is I love to talk about my grandmother. My grandmother lived to be 103 years old. And one of the greatest things about my grandmother, she called her on death. Because she walked with Christ so much, and she walked so well with Christ, she could tell you how she was going to go out. And I'll tell you exactly what she told me, and my wife was with me, because I don't know if we were married at the time. She said, I said, Granny, how long are you going to live? She said, when God stops taking my feet from me to where I cannot tell the gospel, or tell anybody about the gospel, then he'll take me out. And I said, well, do you know when that's going to come? And he had, nope. At 101 years old, a nurse came into her bedroom, and she said, Miss, Miss Reba, it's the worst day of my life. So I've lost everything, lost my husband. He's gone. I'm going home to an empty house. And she called her over, and she started praying with her. She's 101 years old. Legally blind, and she quoted 20 different scriptures for this woman. Mm -hmm. I said, Man, that's the kind of love I want to have is when you know God so much that you don't have to look at the Bible, you can just, it's there. And I listened to her tell the story. She said, Here's the thing, and she got saved that night. Hey, man. Mm -hmm. But here's the awesome thing she told her when she got done, when she led her in that, um, believer's prayer, she goes, Now you can go home and rejoice for what Christ has done for you. Uh -huh. She goes, but you don't understand, I was going home to kill myself. Oh, my. <laughs> a year later, she was walking down the hallway, slipped in a puddle of water, fell, broke her hip. One week later, God took her. When she couldn't walk anymore, she was done. <laughs> legacy. So I started thinking, legacy, legacy. Then look at my parents, my mom and dad. A lot of you know my mom and dad. Bill and Becky Summers, they're still members here. And if you know them, they love you any, probably more than I even love you. And, but my mom's got to mention that. But my mom grew up in that same mentality of who she was. But see, she was the smartest woman. She was a valedictorian of her graduating class. But a lot of ladies might understand this, may not. A lot of older men will understand this. She was valedictorian in her class, had a full ride to UNC Chapel Hill to become a nurse. Did most women go to college in the 50s? <coughs> no. That's because she came from a family of all daughters who ran on a farm. And she gave up her college degree to stay on the farm to help dad. Because that's what she was supposed to do. That's what was required of her. So she did what was her identity was, is I'll do what takes that family to get to the next place in life. That was her identity. But her legacy was is that she never stop loving Jesus Christ for our Lord and Savior. See, the greatest thing I love about my grandmother, this is part I did, I forgot to tell you, and I wanted to tell you, is my grandfather wanted to court her. He wanted to court her, and she said no. She says, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. She says, if you want to know me, and you want to be with me, you will come to church with me, and then when the time's right, and God's touched your heart, then we'll talk about it. He went to church with her about five months, on the fifth month, he came down and she said she looked over and he said he was sweating. And it was air conditioned. And of course, back in you know those days, they would have air conditioned in churches. He said he was just sweating more than usual. And she said she looked over and he was locked in that pew and he said God was speaking for him. He broke down. And I said, when a woman speaks like that, she says, I will not marry you. I will not even date you until you are saved. But you can come with me. She loved showing him what it took to be a Christian. Now look at my dad. My dad has had more people, more kids in my house that have come from troubled past. That's too many to name. It's too many to even think about. The youth have always been there. So the legacy is there. It's been instilled to me. My job now as a father is I got to instill that in my son. And I got to get him to appreciate the legacy. Just like we talked about with the firefighters, we got traditions. Military, have, we have traditions, do we not? And we walk those traditions because why? Because the men before us and the ladies before us 
did it right. And what we have to do is we honor them for what we do by how we walk it. My son, the greatest honor he can do for me is to walk the lot walk greater than I ever walked it. My, my encouragement for him is I'd love to see him bring more people to Christ than I ever thought I ever did with the youth. That's what our legacy and tradition. That's how we're still hand in hand. My identity might change in how you see me, but my legacy still stays the same. My legacy has got to be the fact that Jesus Christ still got to be number one in my life. Whether I'm at the firehouse or where I'm at my own house. So where, is my, where does that come and where does that identity come from? Because see, I invited two people. I didn't know if they were there to come. That come that I ran calls within the last couple of years with. Um, Madison is not here. We had here's a young lady that she's twenty something years old. And I'll just say her first name. Um, she would have been in the papers. Um, it was a major, major extrication. Um, when I drove up, I became incident command on the call. During that call. She, she had got head on with a semi truck on a back road. It basically put the engine basically in her lap. We had to cut for over 20 minutes, trying to cut parts of the car apart. Basically had to peel it off of like an onion. At the point we pulled her off, the wrist was hanging on by just skin this much, just skin. The foot we thought was completely gone, it was mush. Her knees, you could see both knees were exposed. Screaming excruciating pain. We took her out. And we put her where we need to be. Okay? <clears throat> when we got through, I asked her if I could tell the story tonight. I asked her, I said, is this possible I can tell the story? She said, yeah. Is that we didn't know if she'd make it. I haven't talked, seen, I haven't seen them since that day. And I know my my firefighters that day and my EMTs worked as hard as they could have ever worked to try to save somebody's life. About three weeks ago, I was at the Rock Hill football game and I'm talking to a friend of mine. And I see this young lady that's in a wheelchair. And I just see her there. I'm talking to this friend and she tied the tug on. I'm thinking she's probably going to just go. I'm going to go, to, you know, I'm ready to go get something to eat over it. It was about half time. And the girl said, no. She goes, listen now. She goes, Miss Summers, were you on this call? I said, I looked down. I said, who are you? She told me it was her. And I said, how are you? She goes, I'm also. And I said, how do you know? How did you know it was me that was on the call? And she said, because here's where we're getting to the identity of understanding where you're at in life. Is that... She looked at me and she, with the straightest face that she could say, is when I was in the back of the ambulance, you got back up there and your voice was the only common spirit to be touched with me and said, Madison, we got you, we're gonna take care of you. She said, I never saw you because blood was everywhere. Right. And she said, mm. she goes, but when you started speaking, I said, I know that voice. Mm. My question is, that trauma set in her life that said she knew my voice. So my question is, as we as adults and even kids, how quickly are we not listening to God's sweet voice that he already, he called us already. We know we've already accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but how quickly are we having going through bad days and bad times? She went through the worst day of her life. Up to this point in her life, she went through the worst day of her life. And she looked over and she said, it was your voice that made me realize I was okay. And she goes, that's the voice I remember. Sometimes we need to be remembered with our identity. Sometimes it ain't the looks that we need to see in the identity. We need to remember the identity of Jesus Christ. We need to step back sometimes and just hear that sweet voice that we remember that they that called us home, you know, and said, you're mine. You've got to remember, you're mine. And we need to sometimes hear that and hear it other time. 
hear some of the other things that go on. I will say, and all of us have been in the service, we've lost. We've lost some too. We've lost some things. And I will tell you, this is this situation where a couple years ago, it still sticks with me to this day. It was the most, I hope I can get through it without crying myself because I still get emotional when I think about it. We went on a call where a five-year-old called 911 to take care of mom. Well, the reason he called is because he was late for school. He knew mom was supposed to take him to school. We get to the bathroom and mom has passed away. Somehow she tripped or slipped on the wet floor, hit her head on the sink, on the sink and she bled, either bled out or just aneurysm or whatever. She passed away. This boy's having a good day, because in his world, he's got his cartoons on, he's trying to eat. And I'm thinking, how do I hold this together? Because how we got, so we got dad. I said, hey, can you got dad's number? We called dad. dad. Here's the thing, dad's in Virginia. He's in a business meeting in Virginia. No dad, right now for a medium moment. So, I said, dad, told him what's going on. These parents, listen, take your time, get home. We're, we're going to take care of some stuff here. I said, but we will be in touch with you every five minutes. Every five to ten minutes, somebody, either me or the police officer, will call you every five to ten minutes. And we'll let you know where we're at. I said, okay. I said, where's your family? You got any families? I said, we just moved here. He said, that's why I got to do a work in Virginia. I'm trying to transfer. I said, okay, you ain't got no family. So then I called his school. This is where we got to come together as a community. This is the day the community stepped up and said, we're going to step up for everybody. We're going to step up for our kids. We're going to step up for the moment that we've got to be there. So the police officer and I called, found out the school he went to, called the principal. She come with the guidance counselor. So what we call, ended up doing it is they came and got him and took him, fed him. And here's the thing about the police officer was severe. He was a young guy. He was a real guy. We know how the young guys are. It was his hard, first hard call, really hard call. And I looked at him, I said, oh, I said, what he said? He handed me a couple dollars, he said, make sure the kid eats. I said, okay. I said, that's not a problem, I'll make sure it goes. He said, I, I'm gonna be at the car. You can do without me right now. I said, I'm saying, I've been there, you know? And so we go, they take him to school until dad can get home. So he goes to school just like it's going with that. Those are the tough days. Those are days we can go back and say, God, why? You know, why is this? Why do I got to deal with this? You know, I got a new guy in my company, and he's got to deal with this. You know, why are we in this moment right now? That's when God looked at me and said, I chose you. I chose you to be the inspiration to pass on the legacy and tradition of understanding what it's done, like deal with stuff and help them through it. Help them process through this. Let them get through this. Help them get through this moment. I chose you. As much as I told you is that sad, it wasn't bad. I maybe a call or two later that day, we have an overdose of a teenage kid and when I show up, I look at the young girl and I say, listen, did you purposely try to hurt yourself? She said, yes, sir, I did. I said, why? She said, because it wasn't worth living. She said, nobody loved me. I said, honey, me and this officer love you to death. That's why we came. That's why I put my red lights on. That's why... She put her blue lights on. It's because we love you enough to be here. That's why this paramedic just coming up the driveway got his lights on so he can come help you. I said, but why, why are you hurting so bad that you don't think nobody loves you? She goes, I don't have a daddy. And she said, my mama don't care. And she says, I said, well, you're in love. And she was in love. How am I in love? I said, you don't even realize you've been blessed. And I knew the officer, she's a mother, and two paramedics coming up with both fathers. I said, you just got the, you just won the lottery. She said, well, how? I said, because you just inherited three daddies, 
and one mama. I said, the reason why you gotta do three days is because it takes three days to do what one mama does. I said, so, I said, so you lucked out. And she said, but y'all don't understand. I said, no, you don't understand. Is that when we love you enough, we're gonna help you get through this. I said, we're gonna get you through this. We're gonna get you the right doctors. We're gonna get the right people to help you. And we're gonna make sure that you are successful. And I said, don't you worry about that. And she said, she's like, but she looked at, and then she finally had to come talk and everybody did their evaluation. She looked back at me, she grabbed my shirt towel and I said, say yes ma'am. And she looked at me and she goes, what is different about you than what I've seen in this world? I said, see, what you don't understand I know the real father. You said you didn't have a father. You had we never read the real father yet. I said the father that will never leave you nor forsake you. The one that will never leave you when you're in the worst of the pits or on the highest of highs. The one that's on the in the valley with the lilies and on the mountaintops when you can see and soar forever. And she looked at me and she goes, Well, who is that? And I said, That's my God. That's my God. I'll tell you what, when you get help, first thing I want you to do is when you get to the hospitals, I want you to tell them you want whatever pastors on staff to come that they got in home call, and you tell them you want a pastor to come meet you in your room. And I said, and you ask them about that God. I said, well, son, it'll change your life. I've seen her probably about three or four years ago, different woman. She's about 20, I think probably 22 now, 21. In college, living a good life, and she got saved. Amen. Amen. So, what legacy did I leave for my firefighters that day? We don't quit on nobody. You never leave anybody behind. One of the things firefighters always say: we never leave anybody behind. Two in, two out. There's a reason why you got two in, two out. Is because you always got a buddy with you that's going to pick you up and lift you up. Even when the toughest times come. And the reason why you got two out was because you got two more because when Satan attacks you, I got two more to bring you. Because they said two or more are gathered together, I am there. Amen. See, the fire service is nothing for me. The fire service is me opportunity to see the gospel played out. It's a bunch of men and women fellowshipping every day, breaking bread. And fellowshipping and telling people what life is like. So my legacy has got to be at the fire department. My legacy has got to be when I leave, when I retire in whatever amount of years, up maybe 10 years from now, whatever, is that what will my identity be what they see in me? Would they have seen a captain? Or would they see a firefighter? Will they see an EMT? Or will they see a captain who is a man of God who taught them the traditions that apply to everyday walk of life? That's what we want to do. For my, my whole thing tonight was for you is that uh, as military, as first responders, some of them in it now, some are retired from it. Some wishes they were still back in it so they could still be a part of all that. Because you know, part of the thing, if you ever talk to a retiree, whether it's military or whether it's not, what do they always say? I miss the people I was with. You never hear them say, I miss the fight. You never feel them miss the call. It's, I miss the people that I'm with. Because that fellowship and the tradition of fellowshipping around a table, breaking bread, is was done in Acts as the first church, and we practice it every day in the firehouse. I got the benefit of having a job where every day at supper time we get to break bread, we get the fellowship, and at my station, praise the good Lord, I got a bunch of guys that will allow me to do this. They'll let me pray for our meal. Amen. So, so when I talk about identity or legacy of, my hope is that when I leave this service, that I left them 
with hope. So if I ever come to any calls that you're on, my whole goal is I want to leave you with hope. I want to leave you with the hope that no matter what the situation is, I want you to always believe that Jesus Christ is going to be there to help you. I might not be able to save everybody. I have to save everybody. You know, last year I had to, a couple years ago, I felt like we didn't save anybody that year. I was like, you know, you get that frustration because you got, I got in this job to save people. Sometimes you just have that year and just not you. Well, guess what? The very next year, Chief Barnes is here. He can validate this. I delivered my very first baby <laughs> and a carpet. <laughs> of course, she, I say I delivered, and Mama says her number six. She kind of did. <laughs> she was telling me, well, you got to get the towels now. You need to do this. You're in court. You know, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, no, she's still sweet for me, and we still keep up with that family. But keep up with that family. I get to see that baby. She posts pictures of that baby every day. And I love it. I love it. And she. She's now got to know my family just because of Facebook. Because she's bad. She don't kill parents. I love watching your Sunday nights. She goes, I want my kids to be that way. That's how she sees me. But I'm hoping when it's all said and done that her boys and her girl, this baby girl, first girl in her family, will see me more as a man of God than as a firefighter they know. Hey, it was exciting. That was an exhilarating moment. Because what is the cheapest? 1% of every firefighter will only deliver a child in the field. They will deliver sometimes in the back of an ambulance, but there's only a 1% chance that any firefighter in their career will ever deliver a baby in the field. And I had an opportunity. God chose me to do something special and celebrate a miracle in life. So it comes out to challenge it up. I kind of challenge you with this right here. There's several men in this church that are mentors of mine. One's gone to pass on this past year. Um, Jim Pat, I think this past year, went on to see the Lord. But that man taught me a lot of stuff. He mentored me. Wayne Lane. Wayne, uh, he's led me to a lot of things. And he's done a lot of things. He's gone from one end to the other. He's gone in 180. He's talking about salvation. That man got it. He held on. He just kept on going. But now he's dealing with cancer, right? Right. He come back. You think that man's worried about it? Because that man knows where he walks. He knows where he walks. Yeah, he worries about the day to day because of, that's just life. But don't. I bet you guarantee that man gets up and prays every day and says, "God, whatever happens today." That my foot, where my foot stands, that's where God will stand with me. That's my solid rock right where I'm at. I looked at him and Ronald Timmons. That's another great man here. Bus ministry. Took a bus ministry. Look where, you, look where it's at now. Look at all the salvations that have come out of that. There's many more. There's many more people I could say mentor so, as adults that we're in here right now, this is my challenge to you. No matter, no matter what your identity is, or how you see yourself, or how you think other people see you, where is your legacy going to identify you as? Will your kids look at you? Are you setting an example that there's going to be more Christians down the road? That the rest of your family is going to be covered by God and going to be Christians? Or are you not going to share the greatest news you know and never make a difference? What good would I be as a firefighter of 18 years if two things didn't happen? What good would I be that if I had all this knowledge of 18 years of how to fight fire and how to do medical policy and I never shared it with y'all in the community and never tried to practice it and take care of you guys? I wouldn't have done nobody any good. I'd have all this knowledge and didn't do nothing with it. The second thing is, I never shared it with the fellas and ladies and the gentlemen and ladies that are coming behind me. If I don't share it with them, I all that knowledge. 
then what am I preparing them for? I'm preparing them for failure. Preparing them to never be ready. See, one of the things that a lot of things said about me at the firehouse, they say a lot of crazy things. Is one thing that they will say is that when I get there, I'm usually very calm at that moment. At the moment it happens. And then it, it might go one way or the other at that point. But usually when I get off the truck, I'm calm. Nothing special about it. It's just you get in that zone. Y'all know what it is. You know what I'm saying? You can't describe it. People ask you, how do you get in that zone? How do you do to get in that zone? I do not know. All I know is that when I get in that zone, I can block every one of y'all out. I can block everybody out but the people I'm taking care of. I know exactly where my crew is and what they're doing, and I can block everything else out. I know it's like everything goes to a blur except for about three people that are on my trouble team. I know exactly what they're doing. How do you explain it? The guys in the military, if you understand it the same way, if you're in combat, pretty much what I've heard is that everything around you blocks out except for what your immediate people that you're dealing with at that moment. Who explains that? I don't know. All I can say is that right now, if it wasn't for these men and women who have fought for our country, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. So I appreciate them. I appreciate everything they've done. I appreciate everything they did. My dad fought the Korean War. And I appreciate everything he's ever done for me. Not, not just for my freedom, but that he passed on the legacy of who Christ is and lived it out with dealing with youth and helping so many youth get started back on their track. But guess what I love to do? I love to just be around you. They make me feel young again. Of course, they let me know how old I am. <laughs> very quick. My son's very quick to point out that I'm 50 years old. I mean, when you hear the jokes at the dinner table about, hey, something to come up, he said, hey, well, did they do that back when the Model T's were still going around? I'm like, I'm not a dad, uncle. But here's my thing. Is I really want to challenge you to do. And I appreciate you listening to me tonight. And I'm hoping I'm saying something that maybe hopefully hits home somewhere along the line. Is that from this day, make it a point to realize, make a difference in the more tomorrow, make a difference in somebody's life. It ain't nothing but shaking their hand, telling your grand point. They changed the identity how people don't see you. I think a lot of people get caught up in the same way. All I am is I work at Walmart. Or all I am is I work in sanitation. Or all I am is, is I hear that. I hear that from you. All I am is I just take trash cans around. No, you're not. I say that's called if you only see that. Look at what cops doing with you. And where you're at, how can I be used right there? That's where I want you to see. So if you're I'm going to honor. I'd like to finish in prayer, and I'll close with that. Most precious Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to speak this group tonight, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity that you hopefully broke me tonight, too, Lord, and you uh, allow me to be restored, Lord, tonight. And I pray, Lord, for forgiveness of my sins, Lord, that they didn't interfere with the opportunity to speak tonight, Lord, and that your words came through me and to these people, and that they touched their hearts, Lord. And that you could actually um, be in the midst of everybody right now, Lord, that we gather together and excite, excitedly knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of our life. And we thank you for all that you've done. I thank you for all the men and women who have served in this room right here, Lord. I thank you for their sacrifices and the love that they've done and their willingness to do it. For all the first responders who are here tonight, Lord, for what you do every day, for the things that they have to see, you still restore them. And you say, keep going because we need you. Our community needs you. And I thank you for this church and the people, members of this church who are so willing to just share the gospel and continue to spread the word of Jesus Christ throughout this nation and in this own community. Lord, I love you tonight. I pray that you help them tomorrow wake up and realize a new identity in Christ is to build that legacy that points straight away to you. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.